All right, so uh, what we're going to start doing today is we're going to start talking about stereochemistry, and uh, this can be confusing, okay? So, <clears throat> that says the three-dimensional structures of a molecule can greatly affect its physical and chemical properties. So first of all, let me say this. What, what kind of isomers do you know about? Structural, Structural isomers, right? So structural isomers have what kind of different properties? What properties would you expect to find to be different in structural isomers or constitutional isomers? Melting point, Melting point boiling point, right, all those things. Okay, so we're going to get into an area called stereoisomers. And in stereoisomers, the only thing that's different is not the, how the atoms are connected, but the way they're connected in space. So they look different on a three-dimensional level, but they're connected the same way, they have exactly the same properties, except for a couple, okay? So before we get into that, what I want to talk about is, I don't know, I was always interested in, uh, even in college, uh, catecholamines, and uh, adrenaline, you guys know what adrenaline is? Where, where do you see your adrenaline stored? In the adrenal glands, right? And, and it, uh, there, you have a, is it your liver? No, it's on top of your kidney. It sits on top, there's a little blob that sits there. Adrenal yeah, the adrenal gland. It has, a, has different layers in it. But in, in your body, as a hormone, uh, adrenaline is released from there. Anybody else know where you find a lot of it? in your brain, okay? Brain, brain, as one of the neurotransmitters in your brain, it's in the, your cerebral cortex. Uh, dopamine is closely related. If you, if you get rid of the CH3 group over here and this OH, that would be dopamine. And that's motor movement and emotion and rage and happy and addiction and all kinds of other weird things, okay? These are all known as catecholamines. These are catechol groups. And... Um, one of the things about adrenaline is, and I don't know if you guys have recognized this, like when you start exercising and you get your adrenaline levels up, that your, like your nose clears up, like you can breathe better. Right. So people knew this for a long time. So it turns out you used to be able to get an adrenaline inhaler if you had asthma. They probably called it epinephrine. Epinephrine is just another name for adrenaline. Okay. My experience in... <clears throat> in, uh, in uh, research is that uh, epinephrine is when it's in your head and adrenaline is when it's in your adrenal cell. But we actually studied both. So we'd actually go to the butcher, like the actual, where they slaughtered the cows, and we would ask the guy, hey, we need adrenal glands. And it was like really gross magic, but like magic. He would just reach inside the cow and pull it out. <laughs> I'm like, how did you find that? I knew where it was. Like, okay, and then we would pack it on ice and take it back to the lab, and we were especially looking for the adrenal chromaffin cells, and we were studying those, the exocytosis process in those cells. So anyways, and we did a lot of really cool things, and we'll talk, I could talk about it sometime. I've given talks on it before. But the idea is, is this is a great drug, except this catechol o methyl transferase what the COMT enzyme does is it does this, and that inactivates it, okay? So people recognize that adrenaline is a great drug, <clears throat> except for there are some side effects. What do you think the side effects for adrenaline inhalers are <laughs> with children, hyperactive children? <laughs> <laughs> right? Nobody likes that. I mean, okay, almost nobody likes that. Grandparents apparently like it. Parents don't like it. And so what they did is they modified this drug, it looked like this, and this is albuterol, and this is what's in the albuterol inhaler. So what's different, what's that? Yeah, these big like blocking type groups, this big thing up here, right? What else is different? Oh, yeah, this? Yeah. 
Yeah, that means it could either be forward or backwards. We'll talk about that because that turns out to be really, really important in its pharmacology. Well, I guess that counts. Yeah, that counts. Okay, one more thing. All right. So why don't they do this? How, how, do, how do enzymes work? What is the, the term they use for enzyme? Actually, a term came, they came up with in uh, Scotland. It's actually. Like lock, and key. lock and key, yeah. Why is that important that it came from Scotland? I don't know. I just went to the place. So, right. Most people, they go to like a foreign country, and they're like visiting really cool places, and I'm going to chemistry departments. So, um, but you could go too. Yeah, they put this on there because it doesn't look like this. And because this enzyme does the modification on this particular carbon, it can't do it here. So what happens is, is <clears throat> this inactivates far more slowly than this does. COMT is actually the way your body gets rid of all the catecholamines okay, in the periphery, like on the outside. So if you are a Parkinson's patient and you're taking L-DOPA, L-DOPA is just a version of this with a carboxylic acid group at one end. L-DOPA is used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. One of the problems that they have is it always deactivates because the COMT takes care of this part of the molecule, and then your body just eliminates it. Okay. So they use, a, they use a blocker for COMT so that that enzyme's not as active, because most of that enzyme is actually found like in the periphery, not in the central nervous system. You know why they did this? This is kind of subtle. Sure doesn't look the same, right? Turns out, okay, like for dopamine, this is the only one. I, I study dopamine a lot. Dopamine in the brain, when I was in graduate school, there were only two receptors. Actually, right when I left graduate school, they discovered a third receptor. Each receptor depends on a different portion of the molecule for its action. Well, it turns out, by putting this on here, there are two receptors for this particular molecule. It inactivates its ability to activate one receptor and then more selectively activates another. This is what chemists, these, these chemists do. Even the designer drug people, the guys that, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't know if you know this, in China they're producing all these crazy drugs and then selling them in the United States. As, I don't know, there's stories all over the internet now. All, all, what's that? Yeah, or, or they call it spice. Yeah. yeah. For what? Uh, they usually put on the package, not for human consumption, collector's item. Yeah. So you're not actually supposed to eat it or do anything with it, but it looks a lot like marijuana, so people smoke it. Because, <laughs> you know, if you're a drug user and you want to smoke something, well, you're just going to smoke something. Everybody in the military smokes that. Really? Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, and there's different versions of it, but the ones that, what they're doing, so this is what they do. The FDA outlaws, says, okay, that's a drug that you can't have in the United States. The FDA outlaws it. They already have another drug in the pipeline, and all they do is they modify part of it. And once it's been modified, it's a different drug. It's no longer illegal in the United States. I think what they should do, really, is they should outlaw these things. Right. The shape, remember, this is from chapter one. It's the shape of the molecule. Outlaw the shape of the molecule until it's been tested in humans, and then you kind of solve that whole problem. But anyways, long story short, now they know about at least five or six receptors in your brain. There's even receptors that are different for like Tylenol in different parts of your body and aspirin in different parts of your body. They usually work through the same enzyme, even ibuprofen. So it's like some people will take Tylenol and say, oh, it doesn't do anything for my headache. Some people take Tylenol and say, yeah, it works really good for my headache. It's just the way the receptors and the way you perceive your pain. It's the way the receptors are distributing your body that makes the difference. So anyway, so they come up with this drug, albuterol. <clears throat> and there's two versions of it. And I'm just going to call them R and S for now. Okay? R is usually is the good one. Okay? And S used to be thought of as the not dangerous one. Because in all the drugs that they tested like this, okay, between the R's and the S's of the drugs in this category, the S's really didn't do anything. This is the R and this is the S. How are they different? The direction the OH is going. This one is the R, and I'll teach you how to designate that it's R. And this one is S. I'll teach you how to do that as well, but if that one's R, this one has to be S. 
And when they did a clinical study of it, they actually separated the R from the S, and they treated people with just the R, or a mixture of R and S, an equal concentration mixture of R and S, because that's actually what came in people's inhalers. They had a mixture of R and S. They've changed that now, but a mixture of these two things. 36% fewer people were hospitalized. That's a lot of people. When you think about how many people have asthma in the Central Valley, that's a lot of people. Why, why is that? Because when the molecule just flip around so that the OH... So, this has to do with this concept called chirality. And we'll talk about this. They're stereoisomers. So, they're, they're shaped differently. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to shake hands. Yasmin, right? We're going to shake hands. Ready? <laughs> right? You get the idea? Yeah. R... S. R stands for right, like the right hand. S stands for sinister. <laughs> Cynical. Cynical, yeah. Sinister it, it is the word they use for left-handedness. So, I mean, a lot of cultures, left-handedness was thought to be bad. So my uncle used to always tell me, because he was naturally left-handed, that they would hit him when he yeah. wrote with his left hand. They stopped doing that, then they just started putting you in classes to make you learn how to write right-handed. That's what they did with me. Yeah. And then they stopped that altogether. Yeah, and they realized, eh, it's yeah, creative. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so good, bad drug, bad drug, right? <clears throat> the only difference is this, and it's literally the shape. Is it this hand or this hand? Okay. So we'll come back to those guys when we, when we do the RS assignment. So really, again, stereochemistry has to do with the three-dimensional spatial arrangement, okay? And if you think about an enzyme as a as a, a series of sockets where you have to take a molecule and stick it in. If this is the way the socket looks and this is the molecule, it fits. But if you switch two groups, you can't just rotate it and get it to fit. Okay. Just give you another quick example I'll talk about in my, you know, all these things that I have to do before class and then I always forget like something. Gotta dig these guys out. Right? See these guys? Okay, look the same, right? Are they? No, they're opposite, right? They're opposites. They're mirror images. That's what this is. This is act these are actually mirror images of each other, but they're rotated a little bit. If you try to actually superimpose these, because they even though they look the same, if you try to superimpose them, that means I put the green on the white, the other one changes. These are actually different molecules. And this is the way enzymes work. Okay, all biological, almost all biological mo molecules operate this way. And as a result, most of the time, you could take molecules and throw them through an enzyme, and only one of these will come out. Because it can only operate on one kind of starting molecule. So I put a mixture of molecules in on this side. Only one will come out because the enzyme only activates on one particular shape. So isomers are non-identical molecules that have the same formula. And then we have two classifications. We talked about constitutional isomers. Same molecular formula, different way they're connected. And then there's stereoisomers that have the same molecular formula, same connectivity, same constitution, that's the term constitution, how internally you're connected, okay? But the spatial arrangement is different, okay? So, so how can you draw these? This is the whole purpose for the hatch and the wedge, but we also have cis and trans, so let me just give you a couple of things to think about. We've drawn molecules like this. If I were to flip two of those, actually any two, so draw the same and say D and C and then switch B with A, those would represent two stereoisomers. We're not going to do the constitutional <coughs> isomers. Constitutional isomers would be what? Just a rearrangement of the bonds, right? So if I was doing constitutional isomers, I could do this or this. 
and those are constitutional isomers. So for stereoisomers, we're going to have to designate something's coming out of the board, something's going into the board. Okay. For constitutional isomers, it's not a problem because you just draw them differently. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the big thing. For isomers to exist uh, other than what we call the, the type of stereoisomer I was showing you before, this, the R and the S, there has to be a constraint. Okay? That's something that keeps the molecules from being able to move so that they're just like the other molecule. Okay? Most of the time, this is some sort of rotational constraint. That is, right, it's a cyclic structure, right? for example, can't freely rotate. So this bond can't freely rotate over. So as a result, when these methyl groups are both on one side and the hydrogens are on the other, right, it can't ever be made the same as this one where the CH3s are on opposite sides of the ring. Now, if I was to name this, nomenclature-wise, this would be a cyclohexane, right? So it would be 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. Both of them would have that name. So if that was nomenclature, that would be bad. <laughs> Right. Simple as that. So what you have to do is you have to come up with a system for naming these. And there's actually a couple of different systems okay, that could be used for, the, for this. But the simplest one is either cis or trans. Cis means on the same side. Trans just means like transcontinental. What does that mean? It goes from one side to the other. So what you do if you're trying to do cis and trans, you draw a line. Oops. Draw a line like this. Right. And the similar groups are on the same side. And typically, we look at the hydrogens, OK? Those hydrogens are on the same side of that line. That's cis. So those don't have to just be methyl groups. They could be anything. And they would be cis to each other. This could be a CH2. CH3, and they would still be cis because the hydrogens are on the same side. Draw a line across this one, across the ring, where the constraint is. These are on opposite sides of each other, right? But really, we're looking at these. That's how we usually do it. We look at the hydrogens. This is trans. So we have other ways of creating constraints. The most common other way is to do a pi bond. Remember, pi bonds don't freely rotate. So you can have cis and trans. Do you have a question? Yeah. Do we normally, uh, the reason that we only look at the hydrogens is because of the energy that we know are associated with the hydrogens next to each other? No, nah, it's just. Is it because they're more reactive? That's where more reactions would take place? No, that's because years and years ago, some old organic chemist, probably German, decided that that's the way it should be. Okay. And we look at the hydrogens. Yeah, I don't really know why we do that, but that's, that's generally the way it's done. So we have two molecules that are down here, right? So what I'm going to do, draw a line across the double bond, okay? That's cis. And this one is trans, because the hydrogens are on opposite sides. Now, your book doesn't say that it's always the hydrogens, but generally speaking, that's the way cis and trans are done. And if there's not hydrogens, there's actually another nomenclature system. You'll learn, like, in, you know, like, six chapters, okay? But we don't need to worry about that for now. So this guy is trans on this side. So, what if I do this? By the way, I hate the double bond being drawn level. It just looks weird to me. But I'm gonna, so I'm gonna draw it slightly differently. So the standard line drawing. That's a CH3. That's a CH3, and that's a CH3. Okay, let me ask you this, just a general question. That Can that be cis or trans? No. But why? Because 
on this side, it's the same on both. And remember, it has to be across the double bond. It can't really be across the double bond, be different, because it's the same. So here's one of the things about cis and trans, okay? If you have the same two groups on one of the two carbons, then it can't be cis or trans. It's always just, if you flip it and try to get to the trans or look at the trans. So, for example, if I compared that molecule to this molecule, Oops, sorry. Like that. Oh, you can't see that, can you? Let me draw it up higher. How do I draw that one? So I'll draw this one like this. Like that. What's that? Oh, you talk to Prem for you. My wife used to be hooked on that stuff. Then I had her smoke crack, and it was all better. Oh, great. It's just downhill from there, let me just tell you. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, then it's, oh, I need to drink diet because I'm drinking so much. And then you'd, like, double the amount that you drink. Oh. Yeah. When did he make the jump to crack? Yeah. I'm not going to make any assumptions. <laughs> How do I know you? Never mind. Details. So anyways, this, cat, this molecule and this molecule, the same or different? Same. If I twi flip this, these will be the same. And this group will go up. So this molecule and this molecule are exactly the same. Can't be cis or trans. Two groups are the same on one side. So even if you draw it as trans in your head or cis in your head, if the groups are the same on the end, you can just rotate the molecule over and you're back to the original. Yeah, because like this, if I flip it, this will be pointing up. It'll be just like that. And these are CH3 groups are identical, so if I flip it back and forth, these aren't really looking any different. Do the substitute on the system trans, do the uh, I know it's the hydrogens that we look at. Yeah. But the other two substituents, do they have to be identical? No. Okay. So if you look at just the hydrogens, the other two substituents don't have to be identical. Now your book plays a little bit loose on this because the kind of that's the way it is. Yeah. They'll say two, that you may not have two hydrogens, so let, let's say they gave you this. Oops, sorry. Okay, so now I have a double bond, right? Sure. But you know, there's not a hydrogen over here. I don't have a hydrogen drawn here. So if I draw this line through the center of that double bond like that, You'll notice that the similar groups, that's this group and this group, are opposite of the, each other. Your book would call that trans. But really, there's a better nomenclature for this whole thing other than cis and trans. So I'm just going to say if it's hydrogens it's, are on the same side, it's cis, and hydrogens opposite sides are trans. You just have to recognize that in the literature and the pharmacology and all that kind of stuff, you might see stuff like this, and they might call it trans. Don't get all hung up on, oh, that's not trans. <laughs> Right. They're trying to tell you something about the molecule, why it's important, right. and then just pass it off as it's a bunch of old guys <laughs> that decided this. It's not that important. <clears throat> By the way, nomenclature is not my favorite thing, so I, every chance I get to say something bad about it, I will. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, identify the following pairs as either constitutional isomers, stereo isomers, or identical, and then explain. So what's this? Identical. I just, this is the one I just did. Right? So if I drew it like level here, what's this? Constitutional. Can't be the same. Can't be stereoisomers. Okay. What about this? Stereo. If you draw a line here, or you draw a line here, okay. What you have is hydrogens on this side, hydrogens on this side. But these groups, that's a methyl and an ethyl group. That's a methyl and an ethyl group, right? 
So if you identify it that way, as the same things attached, this has to be a cis, this has to be a trans. So these are stereoisomers. Yeah. So the way I, I think the best way to do it, just sort of from a mechanics way of doing it, just draw a line across the double bond and then look at the things that are attached on both ends. On the same side of this line. And we would call that cis. Really, we're looking at the hydrogens, but it's hard to focus on the hydrogens because we won't draw them on there. Right, these two hydrogens that are here are together, so that's cis. And here, when you do the line and you get them opposite sides, there's a methyl and an ethyl again. All right, that's trans. And they're on opposite sides, that's trans. Okay, so what about these two? Same, just flip. That's one option. But you, so this is an axial and an equatorial, and this is axial and axial. And when you when you do a ring flip. A, A's become E's and E's become A's, the axial equatorial switch, okay? So what are they? But they're still connected to the same atoms. So it is a stereoisomer. Okay. So let's, let's go over this. Yeah, it's not the same. If you draw a line here, oops, if you draw a line there, right, so to speak, there's a hydrogen that comes down here. That's here. There's a hydrogen here. Now, this is on the bottom of this carbon, right? And this is on the bottom of this carbon. Because that one's going up and that one's going up. So these, this is cis. On this one, thinking about a line being drawn across there. Oops, sorry. Let me put that mark there. There's a hydrogen there. And a hydrogen here. All right, because this is the axial one going down. So this hydrogen is on the top of this carbon. And this one is on the bottom of this carbon. So what is it? Trans. It's trans. How do we know that? What is the axis of rotation? How do you say it again? Uh, how do we know that uh, we draw that uh, axis line? Oh, I just connected these two, but that's the ease. That's for the two that are adjacent. The easy way to visualize it. The, the correct way to do it is always to look at the carbon and say, okay, is it axial or equatorial? Is it, is it on the top part or the bottom part of that particular carbon? So, for example, let's draw a different one, okay, where you can't necessarily do that. And then uh, let's do one like this. Thanks. And um, this. Okay? So you can't really like just draw a very clean line on them. But on this one, that's the one going straight up. It's axial. Okay? So that means on the, that carbon, there's another equatorial hydrogen here. Okay? On this one, this one's equatorial. Remember, the axials are always a vertical, so this is an equatorial one here. So the hydrogen goes which direction? Up. Uh, so this hydrogen's on the top of the carbon because if you think about spatially, there's a carbon here, right? 
This side is above, and this one is below. Because this, these axials are pointing upward. So this would be trans. Yeah, it can't. So when you have a ring, you just because you think about it, it's connected on the other end. So that means it can't just flip over because it is connected. Double bonds also give it a constraint. So anytime there's a constraint, either either it's a double bond or a ring, you ha can have cis or trans. Okay. What other are we going to go over other constraints? Those are the two major ones. Yeah, they're connected in some way across one side. Edgar? This one? Okay, so let me, let me do this. Um, let me clean it up. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to go back over this one because this is important that you be able to do these kinds of things. So looking, look at this, looking at this uh, carbon here, okay? What is this one? Axial equatorial. Equatorial. So then I'll have a Hydrogen going down like this, correct? Yes. And then, and then this one, that's axial. axial. So the hydrogen's equatorial and must be going down over here. Yeah. Now, on, on this carbon, this OH is on the top relative to this where the carbon is versus the hydrogen and the ring. Okay. All right. This H is on the this OH is on the top, and these H is on the bottom. So samples go by neighboring carbon on yeah. the ring and on the opposites? Yeah. Okay, I get it. So, so these are H. These are cis. Uh, and you can do it anywhere. So, by the way, if you have this, oops, if you have this, and somebody asks you, is it cis or trans, you can't be any of those because you actually have three groups. So there has to be a better way to do all this, and there is. Okay. So on that one, the reason why stereoisomer is because it's connected not to a different atom, but on, in a different place? Different direction, different spatial place. That's a stereoisomer. So these, this is stereo, the one I just did. What about number one? What did I say about axial and equatorial on a ring flip? Number one, axial and equatorial on a ring flip. They flip, they flip right? Well, they go from one to So you notice how it's, yeah, it doesn't really flip, but they, yeah. they go, if it's axial, it becomes equatorial when you do a ring flip. And if it's equatorial, it becomes axial. So this is equatorial, right? You notice this side is pointed down over here. So this end of the, the ring is pointed in the downward direction. Over here, it's pointed in the upward direction, right? That's a ring flip. Since this one is equatorial on the ring here, it will have to be axial over here if it's the same molecule, okay? So it looks different, but it's just the ring flip that causes it to happen. And so it's identical. Now, actually had it here until I pulled it apart. So that's so you see it. I actually see it, see it. Uh, that's that molecule. You notice this side's going down. I don't know if you can see it from back there. You're all younger. <laughs> like that. So, oh, sorry, like that. I had it all screwed up. This side's going up, that side's going up. If I ring flip it, okay, that means I take this end and pull it up, and this side and pull it down. Now, this side's going up, this side's going down, and it's axis. So it's the same molecule, it can just interconvert fairly freely. Depending on the size of the group, it may prefer one or the other, but it can flip nonetheless. So in essence, a ring flip is just some, some single bonds rotating up and some single bonds rotating down? Yeah. 
So one end is up and one end is down, so that's why I call it a ring. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes from being one chair, all right, to, sorry, so I can tort it, to another chair. The chair with either this group going down and this green group in the equatorial position or this, green, this carbon going up and the green group in the axial position. Is it generally um, true that uh, with the uh, uh, reactions that it's more in the equatorial position? Just yeah, like general preference is equatorial position unless there's some overriding factor. Lowest okay. energy. Yeah, lowest energy is what wins, right. but most of the time equatorial is the lowest energy position for large bulky groups. So. It, and and <clears throat> it just has to be larger than hydrogen, which last I checked... Right. There were a lot of things larger than hydrogen. All right, so I said some of this stuff already. By the way, anybody needs to borrow reading glasses, all right? The, you've got young guys. You just, yeah, I know. I didn't need them till I was forty-five. Oh, by the way, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm skipping. By the way, I'm skipping these slides. But I said all this stuff already. Your book likes to focus on the fluorines instead of the hydrogens, but they do acknowledge. See, they will say that this is trans, but in reality, we would call it trans, like a lot of people will call it trans, but in reality, trans refers to the hydrogens. Okay, so uh, we've been over a lot of this too, so cis, trans, or neither, just to review, right? Draw the, when you do that designation, you draw a line like that, same side, cis. This one, you look at the hydrogens. Oops, that was bad, sorry. What's that one? Cis. This one, again, you look at the hydrogens. All right, that, this one is going up. That one's going down, so it's trans. What about this one? Neither. Neither. Sorry, I'm not doing these in order. Was that neither? Was and, there, and, and then this is that line, right? So I have a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. So that one's trans. Again, this one is neither because if I move this up, right, and then I, I could just flip the molecule around because these two groups are the same. So anytime you have the say on any one carbon, you have two groups that are the same. It can't be either, it can't be cis or trans. It's just the same. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, just neither. <laughs> Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about chiral. Okay, there's a couple of interesting words in here. Chiral. Oh, well, it's interesting if you stay on the same slide. So, <clears throat> chiral means handed. That's a term. It actually means handed. And that's why we use the R and the S for the left and the right, because, well, they, most of us only have two hands. And one's left and one's right, regardless of what anybody says about you. So, in a chiral object, okay, when you take its mirror image, you can't superimpose it. Okay. I love that word because, it, to me, it looks like super impossible. That's how I like to read it, but it's not that's what, not what it says. So you can check chirality regardless of anything else by taking two objects, looking at their mirror images. Oh, wait. Wait, green. Green. Ah, there we go. Looking at the mirror image and then trying to superimpose it. Okay, so you take the mirror image of it. And you try to see, is that the same? And it's not. Superimposable means you could just lay them right on top of each other. 
So you notice how those are switched, even though those are the same now. Okay. So when you have non-superimposable mirror images, <coughs> my hands, right? Mirror image, hopefully. If I was a shop teacher, you know, I might be like missing a part of the mirror image. But mirror image, non-superimposable. Right? Can't put them on top of each other. I always thought that would be really cool if they were, because then I'd have a thumb here and a thumb here. Think how fast you could play video games if you had two thumbs. <laughs> what? Paraplegic? Quadriplegic. Probably a quadriplegic. All four. Well, then he just has a problem. He, it probably started off as a bet in a bar. I bet you can't play a video game with your tongue. And the guy said, I bet you I can. And then that's all. You know, bets that start in bars, usually it's downhill. It doesn't usually start very high at the bar, and they, the bar just keeps going lower. Just oh, uh, <laughs> slow down there, buddy. I'm recording this. <laughs> so, <clears throat> hang on. So here's the key for chiral objects. The most common way to get chiral objects is you have a carbon, okay with four different groups attached to it, and that makes it chiral. And I already made the handheld model to show that the mirror images are not superimposable, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But if you have four different groups on a carbon, then it is very likely a chiral molecule. And that ca carbon is known as a chirality center or a stereo center. Oh, yeah, yeah, I keep doing that. So let me write these terms down here. It's a chirality center. And another term for it is stereo center. It, okay, so now chirality explicitly means non-superimposable mirror image. Okay, a stereo center can include double bonds. Because anything that can give you stereoisomers is called a stereo center. So, just here's a real quick uh, thought experiment. If you have one stereo center, and we're going to do a little number of isomers. This is the maximum number of isomers. If I have one stereo center, how many isomers did you have? Two. Okay. What do you think happens if you have two? What's the maximum you think you could have? Eight. You have the right idea, though. I know where you're going. If you have two stereo centers, you could have four. Okay. Is that? Is it exponential? It's exponential. So three is the eight. It's always two to the n. Okay. Sugar molecules like glucose, when you're in the open straight chain form, they have four. So when we talk about glucose and we say, oh, glucose, yeah, what's the formula of glucose, everybody? C six H twelve O six. Okay, that actually represents, that formula, oh, that's a 12. It's not C6H1 liter O6. You know, it's these, these it's, I'm blaming the pen. <clears throat> my, my fifth grade teacher would, would blame my fat fingers. Actually, that's what he did. He said, your fingers are so fat, you'll never write well. And then I, yeah. I ignored him for the rest of my life, <laughs> except for to make fun of him because I don't know whatever happened to him. <laughs> I, learned, I learned to type, and then I went to graduate school, so, yeah. I wasn't an angry elementary school teacher. <laughs> sorry, I'm just making, sorry. I'm pretty happy, you know, compared to him. So, 
Why are you making comments like that to children? You got to think, what is wrong with you? I know that now. Back then, I'm just like, I'm ignoring you because you just, I don't like you. No, so that's uh, C6H12O6. How many, how many stereoisomers? If I said there's four, there's 16 different possible stereoisomers. Okay. And it turns out, like when we say C6H12O6, there's actually... 16 different sugars with that formula, half of which are naturally occurring. So mannose, glucose, um, a rabin, not a rabinose, mannose, glucose, idose, uh, there's a bunch of these weird sugars that they isolate that have that, form, that formula. What does this stereocenter mean? Stereocenter is anything that can give you a stereoisomer. So cis and trans. So, for example, let's say I had this, okay? I could have also this, right? <coughs> two, two stereoisomers. Stereo but if I had this, all right, I could have this, all right? I can have, I don't know if I can do this on the board without killing myself. This. And what else can I have? This is trans, trans, right? This is cis and cis. This is trans and cis. Well, actually, I need to add something to the end. Otherwise, I don't think I can do this. There. Otherwise, it becomes symmetric, and I lose one of my stereo centers. So this one is cis, and this one's trans. So I could add four. Every time you have a stereo center, you can add another molecule, right? Do you have pairs? So one stereo center could give me two, but two stereo centers could give me four. That makes sense? So what, how do you count them? What is the number of those centers? So this is a stereo center. That's a stereo center. So two. Yeah. The Anything that you, can give you a stereo isomer. But again, it gets more complicated because if I have, for example, like this. Let's just do that. Four different groups on a carbon. That's a stereo center. That's a stereo center. This is a chiral center, and this is a cis trans. Okay. When the carbon the stereo This one? Yeah. Because it's part of this stereo center. The whole thing is the stereo center. On the double bond, two of the atoms are in the stereo center. So if there wasn't a double bond, that would be. Then it would be nothing. It would just be another carbon. <laughs> There are the two centers here? Yeah, there's one here and one here. So how many different molecules are there? It turns out there's four. Because I could make I could switch these or I could make this cis and trans. Well, what is the other one on the end? This one? Yeah. That other one. This one? Yeah. Ah. One? All hydrogens. Have to have four different groups for it to be a chirality center. For it to be chiral, well, it really be chiral, it just has to be asymmetric. It has non superimposable on its mirror image. But generally, that happens when you have four different groups. If any of the two groups are the same, then it's not. So, for example, watch this. So, I'm going to make two groups the same. I'm going to get rid of the orange one on both and replace it with white ones. So most certainly I can make a mirror image of this if I try really hard. There's a mirror image, right? But see, it's no. the same. Because these are not different. So if two groups on a carbon are the same, just like it is for cis and trans, it's not a stereo center. Three 
something here. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Um, this is just as good a place as any to do it. So let, let's say I have So I'm going to show you something real quick. Okay, got to make. I want a demonstration of something really cool. Oh wait, it's not going to be cool if I put the wrong ones on it. I'm going to do a magic trick, right? So I try to build these to be the same mirror image, right? Or actually, it's stereo centers. I try to build my mirror, mirror, mirror images. But when I when I put the two groups together like that to make them the same, they're opposite, right? So watch this. Put this one down. All I'm going to do is switch two of these. So I'm going to put the orange on the green. Now they're the same. So anytime you switch two groups, you, if, it's a stere if it's a chiral center, you generate the opposite molecule. So now if I have two that are exactly the same, like this, okay, these are exactly the same, superimposable. You can't make mirror images, by the way. You can try, but you can't. Mm -hmm. okay. And I take this like purple and white. It doesn't matter which ones, because I did green and orange before. So I'm going to do purple and white this time. And then I figure out how to do the mirror image thing. Ah, curses. I hate this. Wait, did I, did I uh, screw up? Oh, I screwed up. I don't know how I did that. I think I put them back in the same place. So I'm going to do green and white. Okay, there we go. Now. Now I can make a mirror image. There. Ah, good. Right? And then I go like this. They're different again. There are mirror images of each other. Non-superimposable mirror images. They're known as enantiomers of each other. That's the word. Okay. So I'm going to teach you this trick because your book doesn't like you to do it this way. I'm going to teach you to draw the enantiomer of this molecule. Okay. To draw the enantiomer of that molecule, all you have to do is this. What do you think I'm going to do? The mirror image. I'm going to switch two groups. To get the mirror image, rather than drawing it as the mirror image, I'm just going to put H here and CL here. That is the mirror image. I didn't draw it as the mirror image, but it's the non-superimposable mirror image of that. And this way you can see they're non-superimposable when you like try to drag one over the other in your head. It's harder to see that they're mirror images, but to see that they're mirror images, you have to imagine... Like, that's the molecule, and then you rotate it like this. So when you do that, these two groups will switch. So the H will be in the back, and the CL will be in the front, and it will be the mirror image of that molecule. So, that's one pair of stereoisomers. I was just going to ask, uh, how many stereocenters are in, like, a cycle, like a cycle of Is it just one, or is it... There are as many, uh, when you have two group, when you have one group, you can't have it. Because, I'll show you, it, it's the same all the way around. The way around. Okay. But if two groups, you can have four. As many as four. Okay. So here, I have one, two, right? Then for each one of these, I can draw, for example, four more. I could go like this, with that being the same, I'm not going to redraw the whole thing. I could draw it like this, ah, like that, oh, let's see, uh, I don't need to draw that many. Right. The same contortions I did over here. 
But again, that this part is going to be different than this part. I draw exactly the same. I should be able to generate four here. There's one more, but I ran out of space. It's down here. You can imagine. And I get four here. Would this part be the different? Now you have eight. Okay. Three centers, eight. Just wait till the second semester of organic when I draw, make you draw 16 sugar molecules. Oh, awesome. it's, it's actually really easy once you learn how to do it. So, with blue colors, you said, uh, okay. You have to draw it. Okay. And once you draw it, you'll see that there's four stereo. What does it need? It needs four different, right? groups on each carbon. I don't know if you guys have seen this drawing. This is one of the ways that we draw glucose. Have you ever seen that drawing in your biology books? That's a carbon. That's a carbon. That's a carbon. That's a carbon. Right? H, this is an aldehyde, actually. Right. H, aldehyde, hydroxy group, uh, al alcohol group. And then the rest of the molecule, that's a chiral center. That's a chiral center. That's a chiral center. That's a chiral center. Right? So if I want to switch two groups, typically what they'll do is they'll take this and switch it with that. So I can switch this with that, or this with that, or that with that, or that with that. And you can just go all the way up the line, and you find out you get 16 of them if you just sit. I mean, it's kind of a fun exercise. If you like that kind of puzzle game, like, oh, I want to generate all the variations of 2 to the n, then you generate all the variations. Just ruined the fun of the puzzle. What's that? <laughs> you just ruined the fun of the puzzle. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I should have said how many variations are there for this, and then t give you the rule later, but, yeah. Just to get the terminology straight, you said... Enantiomers, is, is this what the enantiomer is here? Yeah, so the mirror image molecules, non superimposable mirror image molecules like these, these are known as enantiomers. Okay. No, because they're all connected. Remember, constitutional isomers connected in different ways. Not spatially, they're just talking about actual different molecules. So, um, constitutional isomer, again, you know, that's a constitute, these are constitutional isomers. Those are all, con they're all the same formula, but different bonding. Different carbon carbon bonds, different carbon hydrogen bonds, that kind of thing. Yes. So, you know, where this question, where you're leading to is a really ugly thing, but let me just mention it to you. Draw all the isomers of, right, C something, H something, O. Now you have to worry about not only all the constitutional isomers, but also the stereo isomers. But once you know that you have four groups attached to one carbon, you know you have a potential stereo center, and then you just draw a switch to the groups, and that's the other stereo isomer. Yeah, so it, yeah, it can get kind of ugly. Yeah, well, not really fast, but because it has taken, what, six weeks to get here? But within a short period of time, I know what you're talking about. Okay, so, um, so like this, one of the things you need to practice for figuring out whether or not it's chiral, and this will help you in your constitutional isomer search, is to recognize the four different groups. So here's one group. There's two groups. There's three groups. What's the fourth group? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. A lot of times the hydrogen's not drawn, right? So there's one group, two groups, three groups. And where's the hydrogen? On the back. What about this molecule?
Oh, let's do OH, sorry. And then the hydrogen would be in the back, right? Is that a chiral? No. Why not? Because it's two of the groups of the same. Same. All right, not chiral. Because no matter what you do, now you can flip the mirror image to make it overlap. This one, chiral. Because even though it's connected to carbons, like these are both carbons on the sides here, right? This one's double bonded, that one's single bonded. Dif they're different, okay? So the H is over there. <clears throat> and again, each one of these has an enantiomer, has a mirror image that's non-superimposable, and you can draw it simply by switching the two groups. Okay. And you don't have to just switch these two groups. You could switch these two groups. Okay. Any two groups that you switch will give you the enantiomer. What if you switch two groups and then you switch another two groups? What do you think happens? You have the same molecule. It's just drawn differently. Okay. So one of the skills that you have to be able to get good at doing is to recognizing how many groups have been switched. Okay, let's see if we can find all the chiral centers. This is the one you're talking about, the cyclohexane with one group, right? If you look at this molecule here, the OH is definitely a different group. I have an H down here. That's definitely a different group. But then if you go around either from the looking down from the OH side counterclockwise or you look down clockwise, they're exactly connected to the same stuff in the same way. So this is one, two, three, four, five carbons connected to the left side and one, two, three, four, five <laughs> carbons connected to the right side. If there was anything different along that path, like another molecule attached, then it would be chiral. Okay, like another atom attached here or a whole other thing attached over here, then it would be chiral because one side would be different. What about uh, this one on the top right? Here. Like it, I have a hydrogen sticking down here, right? So there's one group. There's the other group. But now going around the right side or going around the left side, looking from the top, right? They're different. So there's one chiral center and there's another one right here. Because this one also has another hydrogen attached to it. So there's one group, two groups. And then the carbon chains around the ring are different because as you go around the ring from one side or the other side, you encounter different things. They always make it kind of easy because when these drawings, because a lot of times you'll see hatch and wedge. Hatch and wedge implies that it's probably chiral. Okay. Now, we're just looking for chiral centers, but we're going to expand this in a second to just stereo centers. All right. Is this chiral? Yes. What's the fourth group? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Oops, didn't mean to do that. So the hydrogen is going which direction? Coming out, right? I could either draw it like that, or I could draw it like this. Doesn't matter. It just looks better to the right to me. Maybe I have something against left. So that one is chiral, four different groups. This one, is it chiral? Yeah, because I have on the top, I have the ethyl, I have a methyl, I have this whole other thingy here, right? And I have a hydrogen, so four different groups of chiral. Now, as far as stereo centers go, that's a stereo center, that's a stereo center, and that's a stereo center. So I have three stereo centers, would be eight different molecules you could draw out of this. Four stereo center? Yeah. Here? No, um, here? That one. Oh, yeah. how many groups does it have on it? Three. Three. So you have to be chiral, you have to have four. The, the reason, if you think about this, okay, it's a little bit. If you have three groups, you're flat, right? 
you're always going to be superimposable on your mirror image if you draw yourself flat and draw the mirror image flat. Okay. Because it doesn't have the third dimension. Yeah. It, it's always going to be superimposable. Can be, yeah. Can be. Chiral, as long as it's non-superimposable on its mirror image. That's something you'll have to check. There's these compounds that we call meso, that will, where they are superimposable. This chiral, four groups uh -huh. for a single carbon, okay? But if it's double bonded, then you look at both of them. All right, so these are not separate stereocenters. This is all one stereocenter. By the way, these are great questions to ask because this can be really, really confusing as you go through it. Okay, so let's very quickly, that's a chiral center, that's a chiral center. I'll give you those. On a test, I wouldn't, but yeah, I'm just saying on the lecture. <laughs> what about this one? They drew it like it was. Chiral, not chiral. Not chiral. Why not? You don't like him? Two methyl groups. As long as you have two groups that are the same, it's not chiral. And always superimpose it on its mirror image. You should build models, blah, blah, blah. So just really quickly, how do you draw the mirror image? Well, the simple way is to switch two groups. But your book, and every other book I've seen, likes to imply that that is just not the way you do it. <laughs> they seem to imply that you have to be able to draw a mirror image. And you know my drawing skills. That is the mirror image, right? Because to do the mirror image, you have to start from the mirror plane like this and make exactly the same motions in opposite directions. And then these groups both have to be pointing out because it's the mirror image, and if it was not pointing out, it would not be the mirror image. It would be going something different, right? Yeah, I'm just going to set up the mirror. My God. <laughs> Yeah, but it's much easier. <laughs> it's much easier if I say, okay, is that a chiral center? And say, okay, draw its enantiomer. It's non-superimposable mirror image. Is the not word enantiomer on here anywhere? Oh, yeah, there it is. Enantiomer. No, the enantiomer. Okay. You can just do this. That's the enantiomer. Because... I just, well, hydrogen is implied to the front now, and like CL's in the back. What's an enantiomer? Just, it's just exactly this. It's the non-superimposable mirror image. But it has to be the mirror image, okay? Not everything that has a stereoisomer is a, a, a mirror image enantiomer. <clears throat> I like this, too. Um, today, uh, you're going to isolate eugenol. Um, which is clove, but they're all part of the same family. If you look at uh, eugenol, uh, and, or today or this week, I should say, it's, carbo it's related to these carbones, spearmint, mint, right? And caraway seeds are actually enantiomers of each other. And you'll notice the book didn't draw them as mirror images. It actually just flipped one group, even though it just told you to draw the mirror image. <laughs> Just saying, that's, we, we put stuff in book, we show you this is what you're supposed to do, and then we just change it. Okay, this one spells like spearmint, and the other one's caraway. You know caraway and rye bread? That weird, nasty flavor? That's caraway. Some people can't smell the difference between them. It's a genetic thing, okay? And this is actually the part of what gives people the idea that you have stereo receptors, basically stereo selective receptors in your olfactory sensors, that there are multiple receptors. You could detect R and S differently. That's why you smell them as different substances. Oh, so name these. So far, all you can say is that's 2-chlorobutane, right? I like how you did exactly what you said, though. Yeah, see here, too. Molecule. Yeah, and just s switch it. <laughs> it's the easiest thing. You don't have to draw the mirror image. So anyways, sorry. 
getting a little, that was a soapbox moment. So there's Cl and there's Cl on the number one, two, three, four. So this would actually be called 2-chlorobutane. That's the, how we would name it. They have exactly the same names. So what we have to do is we have to designate which one is the left-handed molecule and which one's the right-handed molecule. So let's just do this, uh, this game, visualization game. I'm driving in my car, and I'm going like this. What's wrong? I'm going to run you over. <laughs> so where do you want my steering wheel pointed? Away from you. Right? You want the steering column, if you know what that is. That's the thing that holds the steering wheel. You want the steering column pointed away from you. And then if I go like this, which way am I turning? Right. Right. It's not... It should not be a difficult question. <laughs> I'm going to have driving along like this, left, right? So here's the idea. That's how we're going to name these things. We're going to assign each group a number, and we're going to just do, do stereo isomers by the number. We're going to look at the direction the numbers go, and that tells us R or S. R means I'm turning to the right. S means I'm turning to the left. But the important part is you've got to get the steering column in the right direction. Otherwise, you're going to get run over. Right? If the steering column is pointed in the wrong direction, that means the car is coming at you, and you've got to turn it around. So I'm going to teach you some other stuff that's different than what the book says, so you're going to be able to ignore a lot of slides here. But these are the important rules. It's called the CIP rules, Kahn, Ingold, and Prelog, a bunch of famous chemists. Because they recognize this problem for chiral centers, and they determined this is how you would figure out whether or not something is R or S. You can give them different names. It's based on atomic numbers as priorities. <clears throat> hydrogen is always priority four. If you have a hydrogen on it, it's always the lowest priority. So four is lowest priority, one is highest priority. So we're going to assign priorities to groups. High, that would be 1, and then 2, and 3, and 4. This would be low. And if you have a hydrogen, it's always the hydrogen that's the 4 group. You always want the 4 pointed away from you. Lowest priority faces away from you. So if you have a hydrogen, the hydrogen's always away. On paper, that's a hatch line. Yeah. Exactly. And then you count the priorities, determine whether or not it goes clockwise or counterclockwise. And clockwise means R and counterclockwise means S. Because clockwise means I'm turning right. Counterclockwise means I'm turning left. Okay. So I'm going to show you do this in practice. <clears throat> So atomic numbers, we're going to assign priorities to everything attached to this carbon. So the CL, I love to have a periodic table in this room. I don't have one in the other room I teach in. Not a nice one. 17, atomic number, right? Priority number one. And H is always four. But it's based on, oh, sorry, it's based on the num atomic number 17. That's what I meant to do there. Oxygen is? It's oxygen. Eight. Eight, thank you. And carbon is? Six. All right? And that's where the one, two, three, and four come from. So now you notice the hydrogen's in the front. If I were to assign priorities based on what I see here, I would be going one, two, and three. And which way does it look like it's going right now? Looks like it's going clockwise. Looks like it's going to the right. So I'm going to say it looks R. But here's the catch. For this to work, the four has to be in the back. The low, because like, this is the steering wheel, right? This is the column of the steering wheel. It's pointed at you. Not good. If you want that to be in the back, that is, if I take that group and I put it to the back, what are all these groups going to do? 
They're going to flip around. So, this 